Hi guys, I'm the South African Wanderer and welcome to my guide to the Pilansberg. So in this video, I'm going to try my best to tell you why this is one of my favorite game reserves in South Africa, as well as why I consider this my home park. As you may or may not know, um, I am based in Johannesburg and the Pilansberg is just a two hour, 15 minute drive out from central Johannesburg and about a 90 minute drive from Pretoria. So I've been coming through on a regular basis since about 2015, uh, mostly on day drives um, to the park uh, where I leave early in the morning, get out to the park, spend the day in the park and then uh, get back in to Johannesburg by about seven o'clock in the evening again. This morning I left at uh, about half past four um, and I uh, got onto the M1, then the N1 North past Pretoria and then jumped off onto the N4 um, which uh, does have um, two uh, toll, uh, toll gates on it but they are um, not very uh, expensive tolls. I think they're about 13 Rand each. Um, and then from the N4, I jumped off onto the R556, which is otherwise known as the um, Sun City Road, uh, because Sun City is on the southeastern corner of the park. And uh, the park and Sun City were developed almost in parallel. Uh, the park was declared in 1978 um, and Sun City was built in the early 80s um, as sort of a getaway from uh, the then uh, economic hub of Johannesburg and Pretoria. Um, and it was located in a former homeland uh, called uh, Baputatswana. So um, a casino could be built in Sun City uh, as uh, gambling was illegal in South Africa itself. So one of the things you have to be cognizant of when you're driving the Sun City Road is that there are many intersections on the road and these intersections are generally marked with speed bumps before them to slow the traffic down and uh, they can be quite large speed bumps as well. So if you don't know where they are and you, uh, you know, hit them at full speed of you know 80 or 100 you can do uh, damage to your car so one of the things i try to do uh, when i'm going through is time it so that i'm on the road just as the first light is coming through so that there's no problem of not seeing the speed bumps uh, then there's a big intersection um, with the r530 that you turn onto. 
if you're going to Manyane Gate, which I generally use, and it's about 20 minutes before you get into the tertiary area of the park, and then the secondary area of the park, and um, eventually you get to the uh, Manyane Gate, uh, just past the uh, Manyane Resort, which is then entry into the primary area of the park. So um, this morning I'm at Manyani Gate and I'm going to enter now through the gate. I've just uh, paid my uh, park fees for the day, which is um, 40 Rand for the car and 80 Rand for myself. Uh, so 120 Rand to enter. Um, and uh, I've got my permit for the day. If you are an international guest, you must add a 30 Rand uh, international levy to that cost. Um, and the car only gets charged once. So if you are more than one guest, uh, you're just going to pay that 40 Rand plus um, each uh, additional guest's cost. Um, there is a free week that uh, runs, I think, once, maybe twice a year. The next free week is coming up in October. So I think um, the second week in October is, is a free week. So you can enter free uh, into the resort. The Manyani Gate is also adjacent to the Manyani Resort, which is one of the main accommodation options run by the park itself. Um, the other option uh, run by the park is the uh, Bahatla Resort. The price per night for a four sleeper chalet is, I think, about uh, 3,600 the last time I checked. Um, so it works out about 900 Rand per person per night uh, if you are staying with all four people. Uh, when I travel alone, I uh, prefer to camp. And a campsite with electricity, I think, is just about 400 bucks. So that's um, you know what I normally do. And if you are camping, you will need to use the communal facilities uh, uh, like the ablutions and things like that. Uh, there are restaurants both at Manyane and I think uh, Bahatla resorts that you can then uh, you know get your supper and stuff from if you are staying over. Um, when I'm camping, I generally bring my food along as well. Uh, the other resorts uh, in the park are privately run and include the likes of uh, Ivory Tree, Shepherd's Bush, uh, Kwama Retane, and uh, some of the more exclusive lodges like uh, Black Rhino. Um, they can get uh, quite expensive per night um, with normal prices uh, more than 4,000 Rand per person per night. This includes, uh, you know, two game, game drives a day and includes a uh, board, uh, which is your food uh, and soft drinks. But if you are a uh, SADC region um, resident, you can sometimes get residence discounts. So um, I've seen specials where you can get into uh, Kwa or into Ivory Tree or Shepherd's Bush for uh, between 2.2 two and 2.9 uh, per person per night. That also uh, sometimes depends on how far in advance you are booking. If you are able to travel at short notice, you can uh, get uh, cheaper rates and then sometimes uh, midweek rates are also cheaper than uh, weekend rates. So. Um, you have to get onto their websites and uh, check out uh, what the best rates you can get are. The gate times do vary through the year. So I got here this morning at uh, quarter to seven. Um, if you are coming here in the summertime, which is November to February, the gates will open at half past five and then close again at seven o'clock. So that's basically, uh, you know, the daylight hours. Uh, in the transition uh, seasons, which is spring and autumn, uh, gates open at uh, 6 um, and then close at uh, 6.30. So that's uh, March and April and then September and October again. So it's September, so the gate would have opened at 6 o'clock. That's why it's not as busy um, at the moment. And then um, 
in the winter, which is uh, May to August, uh, you're looking at gate times of half past six uh, in the morning opening and uh, six o'clock in the evening for closing. Um, when you get here in the middle of winter, you know, June, July, half past six, it's still quite dark. So um, that's why they uh, almost limit the, the gate times. The park is generally busiest, uh, you know, during um, the holiday time. So um, in the winter, July school holidays, the park does get busy. And then in the summer, um, especially uh, South African uh, residents come through because our um, peak periods are almost from the 15th of December to the 5th of January. So if you are looking to um, travel and want to avoid the crowds, uh, you know, avoid peak uh, July season and avoid uh, peak uh, December, January season as well. I think um, on, a, on a normal day like today, which is a weekday, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, getting in to the park will be quite easy and it will be uh, a lot uh, less busy than, than usual. While you are at the entrance gate, make sure to check the sightings board for any sightings that uh, would have been seen the previous day and you can adjust your route accordingly. Um, Generally, it's a good indication for where the animals will be on the game drive in the morning as well. Also, um, take the opportunity to get a guidebook for the park, which will contain uh, the map. It comes at about uh, 50 Rand at the entrance gate, and it also contains a lot of information about the history of the park, about the animals in the park, um, distances between uh, you know locations that you're driving to as well as uh, checklists for both birds and animals you can find in the park. So now I'm going to head in on one of my favorite routes to do because I enter at uh, Manyane Gate quite often. Um, I go down Twene Drive to the Tilodi Roop and then back onto Twene and then onto Mankwe Way and the Fish Eagle picnic spot. Uh, quite a productive area as well um, before having breakfast uh, for the morning. I'm at the uh, Lenong viewpoint this morning and if you um, look out, you can actually get quite a good view of the park itself. So looking out on um, the center of the park, you can see that the geology of the park is quite unique in itself. Um, the park was established in what is an uh, extinct volcano. Uh, it was known as the uh, Pilansberg Alkaline Ring Complex, and it's one of three of uh, this type of volcanoes in the world and possibly one of the best preserved uh, volcanoes as well. When the volcano was still active, which was uh, last about 1.2 billion years ago, the height was estimated to be as high as 7,000 meters. But uh, erosion over time has resulted in the volcanic cone actually weathering away. And what we're looking at now is actually the magma chamber of the volcano that once stood in this area. So now the highest point in the reserve stands at about 1,600 meters above sea level. Uh, and what we're looking at is the magma pipes that um, used to carry the magma through the uh, bowels of the volcano almost. Being an alkaline ring complex um, results in some very interesting geology throughout the park with uh, various outcroppings of different deposits um, to be seen at different points. 
uh, most ex interestingly the cyanites and other rare minerals that can be found in the park itself. There is evidence that the area that the park occupies has been inhabited by humans since the Middle Stone Age, uh, where evidence of uh, early hunter-gatherers has been found. The Swana farmers who uh, farmed cattle and grain then moved in and occupied the land until the 1800s when the food trekkers from the uh, Cape Colony started moving inland and uh, the Boer farmers then displaced uh, the Tswana people who uh, originally occupied the land but also helped uh, fight against uh, Mzilakazi when he tried to invade the lands of the Tswana people. The park was uh, then used as uh, cattle farming land mostly, but some of the more uh, fertile uh, valleys uh, due to the volcanic activity allowed for uh, citrus plantations and more annual crops. The park was declared in 1979 and then all the land that the park uh, occupied had to be rehabilitated from farmland into the indigenous uh, savanna that now covers uh, most of the park. Farm buildings had to be uh, taken down, windmills had to be removed, and uh, new roads and fences had to be constructed. And uh, construction for the um, resorts began in 1985 with the construction of the Manyane Resort, um, which at the time was world leading. The park then opened in 1986 uh, for the public and uh, it was developed in parallel with Sun City, which, uh, as I said, borders the southern part of the park and was an ecotourism venture to bring in um, much needed cash into the area and help the local communities benefit from it. After the park was declared a conservation area in 1979, the largest relocation of game animals in the world was initiated, with some 6,000 animals being moved from other reserves in southern Africa into the park in a project called Operation Genesis. It is now estimated that there are over 10,000 large animals in the park and Operation Genesis is hailed as one of the most successful relocations of game in the world. Lions were introduced in the 1990s, making the park a big five game reserve because it then had elephant, white and black rhino, buffalo, lion and leopard. Leopard, as well as some of the smaller cats, such as serval and caracal, as well as brown hyena, were naturally occurring in the area and therefore did not need to be moved into the area when the park was declared. The park is actually renowned for its leopard sightings, but my luck with them hasn't been the best. The park also boasts one of the greatest densities of um, rhino in the country and is one of the best areas to see rhinos in their natural habitat. However, because of this high density, um, the rhinos in the park do face a high poaching pressure as well. And there have been several attempts to try and um, mitigate against poachers, including dehorning the rhinos 
when uh, the uh, lockdowns for COVID-19 were declared, as well as um, anti-poaching patrols on foot and in the air. The park is located in the transition zone between the arid Kalahari savanna to the west and the wetter eastern savannas um, that make up uh, areas such as the Kruger Park and therefore sees an intersection of wildlife from both these areas. So the park is home to both springbok and red hartebeest from the more arid savanna as well as buffalo, white rhino and waterbuck of the wetter savanna. Similarly, the number of bird species in the park is boosted by the park falling in the, the intersection between the dry and the wet savanna. It is estimated that there are more than 300 species of bird in the park and these numbers are boosted in the summer by migratory species that come through the park while it is uh, the wetter and uh, hotter season. I've done a birding day last summer where I spent eight hours identifying different species and I got up to 70 species just in that eight hour span. So if you are a keen birder and have a keen eye for some of the smaller creatures, you can definitely have a great day out in the park just birding. While Operation Genesis has been widely claimed as a success, there were some unintended consequences. When moving elephants, whole family units were moved into the park, including young males. As these uh, young males grew older, they began to have an early onset of uh, must or heat and tried to mate with the older females who then uh, rejected them. This led to frustration in the younger males and they went on uh, killing sprees and killed um, rhino and other large animals at the water holes. Eventually, the park had to move in six large males, primarily from the Kruger, and this helped then suppress the must in the younger males and alleviate some of their frustration. The reserve can be visited throughout the year with both the wet summer months and the drier, cooler winter months, offering different but unique safari experiences. In the summer, be prepared for hot days and sudden rolling thunderstorms with the park filled with abundant bird life, but also much greener and the bush being much thicker, making it harder to spot the animals. In the winter, cold mornings can give way to warm sunny days and clear skies with the less dense vegetation offering better game viewing. Being a summer rainfall area, the park also dries up in the winter and by the end of winter, sitting on water holes or any water bodies in the park will allow great game viewing as animals need to come down to the water to drink before going on with their browsing or grazing activities. This can also attract some of the uh, big cats Cooler mornings and evenings in the winter time, as well as later uh, sun up and sundown, could also allow for more big cat sightings as they are more active when it is cooler. While hot summer days may find them in the shade of their favorite tree for most of the day, only emerging later in the afternoon to go hunt or drink water. For the most part, the park can be accessed with a normal family sedan with uh, three main tarred routes that lead from Manyane uh, Resort to the Pilansburg Center, which is Twene Drive, and then from 
Bakabung Gate up to the Pilansburg Center, which is Kubu Drive, and from Bakhatla Gate down to the Pilansburg Center, which is Khabo Drive. However, these tarred roads can get full of potholes in the rainy season, and the dirt roads can get very corrugated. So while you may be able to access the park with a family sedan, a higher SUV type vehicle is normally recommended. As I mentioned, if you are planning to self-drive, one of the things that you have to do is grab a map from the entrance gates where they sell them for 50 Rand and the book also contains some other information that is very useful. You can then plot a route into the park and decide what you're going to do on your self-drive. I prefer to enter at the Manyani gate. Um, it is one of the routes I know better. And then head down Tsuene Drive towards the Pilansburg Center, taking a few dirt uh, loops along the way, including the uh, loop past the Tolodi Dam, which normally has some activity early in the morning or late in the afternoon. And then heading towards Motlobo Drive and eventually joining up with Mankwe Way, which uh, is also the route to the Fishigal picnic spot where I normally take my breakfast. And then heading towards Kubu Drive and either up towards the Pilansburg Center or down towards Lengu Dam. The lookout at Fishigal picnic spot also gives you a view across to Hippo Loops, which can be a hive of activity as well. So always be sure to check it out and adjust your route accordingly. Another alternative, if you're staying at Sun City or one of the lodges that are outside Sun City, is to enter at uh, Bakabung Gate, which is at the south of the park, and head up Kubu Drive towards the Pilansburg Center. And then as you head up Kubu Drive, you can also take Banyane Way and head across towards Swene Drive. One of the things I like to do towards this, the middle of the day is to head up towards the Lenong viewpoint. Lenong in the local Tswana language means vulture and the Lenong viewpoint is one of the highest points in the park that you can drive up to and then look down on the park. I would not recommend traversing the rest of Safara Drive from the Lenong viewpoint because it does get very rough and you almost need a 4x4 to do that. There have been times when elephants are very scarce in the park and I've had to find them for guests and almost my last roll of the dice is to drive down towards Rehok Dam where the elephants sometimes hide out, let me say. I've often found the elephants um, at the dam playing in the water. And when I don't find the elephants, there's often activity from other animals, including giraffe or zebra or antelope um, at the dam. So while it may be one of the furthest um, western points you can get to on the public roads in the park, it is sometimes worth the drive to get there. Another option is to enter at uh, Komaritane Gate, which is also open to the public, and then drive down Tsepe Drive all the way to Mankwe Way again, and um, then find routes towards the center of the park to spend the rest of the day driving on. There are more quiet routes, um, which are less productive, let me say, and there are busier routes, such as Mankwe Way, where um, generally there are more people driving up and down and therefore there are more sightings because of more eyes on the bush. But also the large open plains of Mankwe Way allow you to look further into the bush and being close to the Mankwe Dam means that animals do move through um, these large open plains from time to time to get to the water. So um, it is one of the more productive routes in the park. As always, any of the routes you 
you take just depends on your luck on the day. And you can take what is sometimes a quieter route and be by yourself on a sighting for much longer if you are lucky on the day. For the most part, the roads are well marked and you can look out for distance markers at most of the major intersections. There are, however, some spots where you will be having to follow the map more closely so that you don't get lost within the park. Um, I have had to guide people out from specific spots uh, because they can't find their way back to the tar roads. So I'm at the Fish Eagle picnic spot, which is my preferred picnic spot to use in the morning. The Fish Eagle picnic spot is off Mankwe Way, which is one of the more productive um, unpaved roads in the park. So the picnic spot makes for a good almost halfway stop down Mankwe Way. And you get here normally about half past eight to nine o'clock and you can grab your picnic. One of the other reasons I love the Fish Eagle picnic spot is because of the view it affords you. The picnic spots offer tables like this one and then do have some braai facilities although I think you have to clean them up yourself and they are quite old unlike some of the picnic spots in the Kruger, they are not serviced, so they do not have service staff who will rent you out a scottle rye and sell you cool drinks and snacks and things like that. So you have to cater for your own breakfast or lunch, whatever you're stopping at the picnic spot for. But there are facilities to wash up after you're done with. So just a tap with cold water and a sink. And the picnic spot also has bathrooms. Um, one thing to be careful of whenever stopping at either the picnic spots or even the hides that have bathrooms is there will be the possibility of running into animals in the bathroom so snakes and spiders so if you are using those facilities just enter with caution i have encountered ring calls as well as uh, herd of puff adders in the bathroom so just be careful as you use them so whenever you get off at any of the picnic spots, there's always the possibility of running into animals because the area is just outside aren't fenced, but uh, you can then get into the fenced areas. So you have to be careful. So I'm at a second picnic spot now, which is the Kuru picnic spot. Um, again, the facilities include tables and prize. Um, Kubu is less of a scenic picnic spot, but it also makes for quite a nice stop in your morning drive. A little bit um, 
further on than the fish eagle picnic spot, but uh, depending on which gate you enter in. Because um, coming in from Bakabun Gate, this will be the first picnic spot you um, reach. Good morning. Morning, morning. This is just a sign for the bathrooms. Obviously this tree is not the bathroom itself. <laughs> so another option, instead of the picnic spots, if you have a packed lunch and don't need a fire and you can be silent about your eating is to visit one of the many hides in the park. Most of the hides are on small water bodies. So you can also do some great birding when you're in them. I'm just walking up to the Ratloko hide now, which is definitely one of my favorite hides to spend time in. The birding is always great and sometimes you get hippos that are here and elephants that come down to drink or rhinos that come down to drink. This one is not wheelchair accessible. Are the hippos around? Oh, and there's elephants. So one of the biggest hides in the park and one of the most popular hides is the hide at the Mankwe Dam, just called Mankwe Hide. Gives a good opportunity to get out of the car and walk around a little bit and down to the hide itself. A few years back, this hide and the walkway that leads to it actually burnt down. There was a fire that spread from the north of the park through into the center of the park. And unfortunately, this hide could not be saved.
if you decide that you're not going to bring your food along, um, there is one restaurant in the uh, park, which is at the um, Pilansburg Center. This building was built originally as the magistrate's building for the area. When the park was founded, the building was converted into the restaurant as well as the curio stalls. There are also bathrooms to use here. And then there's a little water hole that <clears throat> is out the front and they usually put out salt um, here as well. So animals do congregate here from time to time. You just have to be lucky um, to get them. Because they come through for the salt. These are just a few skulls of uh, rhinos that are on display in front of the Pilansburg Center. It's also a very good spot to sit and bird for a little while because there's a birds that do come through, attracted by the possibility of a free lunch. As far as uh, photographic opportunities go, I think the Pilansburg can offer you quite a variety of opportunities as a photographer and has through the years shaped me and my photography as well. I started going to the Pilansburg in 2015 for my own photography as it was so close to, uh, to Johannesburg and it was a big five uh, nature reserve. And I was always hoping to see the leopards as well. And I've had many opportunities to get um, both large um, animals as well as some of the smaller creatures, such as uh, the bird photography that I do. For this reason, I think the Pilansberg has almost shaped my photography quite a bit and I've learned to um, try and compose images uh, differently depending on the landscape we're in or how close the animals are or how far the animals are and have learned, uh, you know, patience while pursuing photography as well because uh, some days you're, the park can be very busy and some days the park can be very quiet. So it teaches you that you may not get a thousand shots every day you're out there. If you do have the patience for it, I would highly suggest just um, sitting in a hide and spending, you know, three, four, five hours in a hide, um, either in a morning session or an afternoon session, as it will prove to be one of the better um, photo opportunities um, to get. Animals do need to drink, especially in the winter, so they will come down to the water and they will give you interaction as well as uh, behavior that you may not see while driving through the park. It's also good to you know check the sightings boards and try and get out to any sightings of interest um, as quickly as possible because animals can move around and if you are searching for instance for lion images or cheetah images the quicker you get there the better the chances of getting the shots you want are the other piece of advice would be to 
get there early almost at gate opening times um, and stay as late as possible so that you are maximizing your time in the golden hours um, at dawn at, and at dusk um, as the light can be spectacular out in the bush um, during the first hours of the day and the last hours of the day. Other than that, I think um, besides luck, um, I must emphasize patience again while you are photographing in the bush. And that brings me to the end of as comprehensive a guide as I could do in the uh, 45 minutes I've used in this video. Hopefully this is helpful for you if you are planning a trip out to the Pilansberg. And don't forget that if you do want a guided trip out to the Pilansberg, you can check out my website and book with me directly or um, or if you prefer, or if you prefer, um, you can check out my offering on Viator or TripAdvisor and book that way as well. So I wish you all the best with your planning for the Pilansberg and here's to excellent sightings when you're in the park.